In aerial warfare, altitude is the ultimate advantage, but nature has a rule. For every 1,000 feet you climb, air density drops by about 3%. By 25,000 feet, a piston engine is wasting. Its volumetric efficiency drops by half. It becomes anemic. The Americans needed a solution to force-feed oxygen to their engines, and the answer wasn't a bigger piston. It was a spinning wheel. 1917. The internal combustion engine is ruled by the auto cycle. Intake, compression, combustion, exhaust. But the cycle has a fatal flaw. It relates to atmospheric pressure to push air into the cylinder during the intake stroke. At sea level, this is fine. 14.7 psi of pressure packs the cylinder with oxygen. But take that plane to 20,000 feet to escape anti-aircraft fire and the pressure drops to just 6.7 psi. The stoichiometric ratio, the ideal mix of 14.7 parts air to one part fuel, becomes impossible to maintain. The engine runs rich. It loses power. It suffocates. Enter Dr. Sanford Moss of General Electric. While other engineers were building bigger cylinders, displacement, to solve the power loss, Moss was obsessed with enthalpy, the total heat content of a system. He looked at the exhaust stroke. When the exhaust valve opens, hot gas exits the cylinder at supersonic speeds, roughly 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, or 800 degrees Celsius. Mostly, this was waste. To Moss, this was high-velocity kinetic energy. His idea? The turbo supercharger. The concept is elegant thermodynamics. Place a radial turbine in the exhaust stream. The expanding hot gases spin the turbine wheel. Connect that turbine via a solid shaft to a centrifugal compressor wheel on the intake side. The compressor sucks in thin ambient air and compresses it adiabatically, forcing dense, oxygen-rich air into the engine. It is a positive feedback loop. The harder the engine works, the more exhaust it creates, the faster the turbo spins, and the more air it forces back in. It's bootstrapping power. Superchargers are driven by a belt from the crankshaft, parasitic loss. Turbochargers are driven by exhaust gas, waste heat recovery. Which is more efficient for high altitude bombers? Let us know why. On paper, it's brilliant. In practice, it was a metallurgical nightmare. The turbine wheel had to spin at 20,000 RPM while being blasted by 1,500 degree exhaust gas. In 1918, most metals turned to liquid at that temperature. Or they would suffer from creep, deforming under centrifugal load. The critics told Moss, you're building a bomb. The turbine blades will shatter and shrapnel the pilot. Moss needed to prove them wrong and he couldn't do it in a lab. He needed thin air. September 1918. Moss takes a 350 horsepower Liberty V12 engine to the top of Pike's Peak. The air pressure at the summit is low, only 60% of sea level. Without the turbo, the massive V12 engine coughed and sputtered, producing a pathetic 230 horsepower. Moss bolted on his prototype GE turbocharger. He opened the throttle. Turbines screamed. The intake manifold pressure gauge climbed. 10 psi, 14 psi, matching sea level pressure. But then it kept climbing. The engine didn't just recover its lost power, it surpassed it. At 14,000 feet, the turbocharged Liberty engine cranked out 356 horsepower, more than it was rated for at sea level. Moss had proven that manifold absolute pressure could be divorced from altitude. But just as the engineers were celebrating, the thermodynamics caught up with them. The temperature inside the cylinders spiked. The spark plugs melted. Why? Because compressing air increases its temperature. Moss was forcing hot, compressed air into the engine, causing pre-detonation, or knock. He had solved the airflow problem, but he had created a heat management problem that threatened to melt the entire engine block. 1920. Sanford Moss had a problem. He had successfully compressed the air at high altitude, restoring the pressure. But he couldn't cheat the laws of physics. Gay-Lussac's law dictates that pressure and temperature are directly proportional. By compressing the thin mountain air, the turbocharger heated it to over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, 
150 degrees Celsius, before it even entered the engine. Hot air is less dense. Worse, hot air causes the fuel to auto-ignite. The engines were literally destroying themselves from the inside out. Moss realised that to make the turbo work, he didn't just need to pump the air, he had to freeze it. The solution was the intercooler. It is a simple thermodynamic device, an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. Moss placed a radiator between the compressor outlet and the engine intake. The hot, compressed air flowed through the inside of the radiator. Freezing cold air from the high-altitude slipstream flowed over the outside heat transfer occurred. The charge air temperature dropped from 300 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The air became denser. The oxygen molecules packed tighter. The engine stopped knocking. It started singing. But solving the intake temperature was only half the battle. The real nightmare was at the back of the plane. The turbine wheel. As the turbochargers grew more powerful, the exhaust gas temperatures climbed to 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit, 870 degrees Celsius. At 20,000 RPM, the centrifugal force on the turbine blades is immense. It tries to rip the blades off the hub. Standard steel softens at these temperatures. It suffers from creep. The metal slowly stretches like taffy until the blades hit the casing and explode. Moss needed a metal that didn't exist. He turned to a medical invention. Decades earlier, an inventor named Elwood Haynes had created a non-corrosive alloy for surgical tools and dental implants. He called it Stellite. It was a mix of cobalt, chromium and tungsten. It was incredibly hard. It was almost impossible to machine. And it was expensive. But crucially, it maintained its strength when red hot. Moss cast the turbine blades out of stellite. It worked. The turbocharger could now survive the hellish environment of the exhaust stream. I got a quiz for you. Stellite is a super alloy. These alloys are still used today in modern jet engines. Do you know what the primary element in modern turbine blades is? I'll give you a hint. It starts with the letter N. With the thermodynamics, intercooler, and the metallurgy, stellite, solved, the US Army Air Corps was ready to build a new kind of weapon. The High Altitude Strategic Bomber. The Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. If you look closely at a B-17, you can see them. Underneath the engine nacelles, there are bucket-shaped housings. Those are the General Electric turbo superchargers. They were the secret weapon. 1942, the air war over Europe. The B-17s flew at 30,000 feet. At that height, the air is so thin that a human will pass out in 60 seconds. The temperature is minus 50 degrees. German pilots in Messerschmitt BF-109s would climb to intercept, but as they passed 25,000 feet, their engines, which used mechanical superchargers, would run out of breath. The German planes became sluggish. They wallowed. But the B-17s, fed by Sanford Moss's turbos, cruised along at full power. For the first two years of the war, the turbocharger gave the Allies total altitude supremacy. It allowed them to bomb the industrial heart of Germany from a height where the enemy simply couldn't fight effectively. Sanford Moss, the man who dragged an engine up Pike's Peak in 1918, was now watching his invention dismantle the Third Reich. But the engineers wanted more. They didn't just want bombers to fly high, they wanted fighters to fly high. They took the massive turbo system from the bomber and tried to stuff it into a single-seat fighter. The result was the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, the Jug. It was the largest, heaviest single-engine fighter of the war. Why? 
because the fuselage was basically a hollow tube wrapped around a massive ducting system for the turbocharger located in the tail. The plumbing was insane. The exhaust went to the back, spun the turbo, and the compressed air had to travel all the way back to the front. Thermodynamically, it was inefficient. Mechanically, it was complex. But in combat, when a P-47 pilot at 30,000 feet pushed the throttle, the turbo spooled up and the seven-ton plane dived on the enemy like a falling piano. Nothing could catch it. Sanford Moss had mastered the piston engine, but in England, Frank Whittle was realising that if you took the turbine and connected it directly to the compressor and burned the fuel between them, you didn't need the piston engine at all. By 1944, the turbocharger had won the war in the high air. But engineers began to notice something. A turbocharger consists of a compressor and a turbine. It takes air, squeezes it, and uses exhaust gas to spin itself. The only thing missing was the piston engine in the middle. Sanford Moss had spent his life trying to help the piston engine breathe, but he had inadvertently built the components that would make the piston engine obsolete. In 1941, the United States received the top secret plans for Frank Whittle's jet engine. The US Army Air Corps had to decide who would build it. They didn't call an aircraft company. They called General Electric. Why? Because of the supercharger department. Because GE was the only company in America that knew how to build a turbine wheel that could spin at 16,000 RPM at 1,500 degrees without exploding. They called Sanford Moss out of retirement. He looked at Whittle's drawings. He smiled. The gas turbine he had written his PhD thesis on in 1903 was finally possible. The mechanics are almost identical. In a turbocharger, the combustion happens in a piston engine. In a jet engine, the combustion happens in a combustion chamber, right between the compressor and the turbine. Moss's team at GE took their turbocharger technology the Stellite blades, the compressor aerodynamics, and built the General Electric IA, the first American jet engine. The technology that allowed B-17s to fly high was the same technology that allowed the P-80 shooting star to fly fast. But the legacy of the turbo didn't just go up into the sky. It came down to the highway. For decades, the turbocharger was seen as exotic aircraft technology. Too hot, too expensive for cars. But then came the diesel revolution. Trucks needed torque, but big engines were heavy. Engineers remembered Moss's lesson. Waste heat is free power. They strapped turbos to diesel engines. Suddenly, a small six-cylinder engine could pull a 40-ton load up a mountain. The turbo diesel became the backbone of global logistics. Today, look at the car in your driveway. It's likely a 1.5-litre or a 2-litre four-cylinder engine. 20 years ago, that would have been a weak engine. But today, it produces 250 horsepower. How? The turbocharger. We aren't using them for high altitude anymore. We are using them for thermal efficiency. By recovering the energy from the exhaust gas, we can make a small engine feel like a big one. We burn less fuel, but we get the same power. Many purists say there is no replacement for displacement, big V8s, but modern engineering says turbo is the replacement. Which side are you on? Naturally aspirated or boosted? Sanford Moss 